Okay. The Dharma, incomparably profound and exquisite, is rarely met with even in hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas. We now can see it, hear it, accept and hold it. May we realize the true mind of the Tathagata. And the Tathagata, of course, is the Buddha. And that Buddha mind is our very own mind. And so what we're doing here on the second day of this July session, seven-day session here at Mount Hyatt Hidden Valley Zen Center in Southern California, is to open to that Buddha mind and to live fully from it instead of sort of coursing over it, uh, a prisoner to a self-image that developed as a result of assumptions about ourselves, conclusions we drew based on how we were treated growing up, the experiences we had and so on. To underscore this, I mention uh, Mario Montesa, who is an Italian-Swiss man who was um, very fond of music and, and, and did a lot of music, actually. And when he was 19 years old, there was an American rock band doing a world concert tour that had just lost their bass guitarist. And so they were uh, auditioning for a replacement right there where he was living. And he got the job. They told him, if you can be on the road with us tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., you, you've got the position. And he did. And he, he stayed with them, played with them for quite a few years. It was, I wish I could remember the name of the band, but I don't. Um, but it was quite a famous one. They had umpty ump gold and platinum re records. They had played concerts in Madison Square Gardens for thousands of people. And they had a, a challenging karma. Five different members of the band had died violently. And so one day, by this time he's married and has a one-year-old son, uh, they were having a, a publicity party in London at a townhouse. And at five o'clock in the morning, he walked out to go home and woke up six weeks later in a hospital. Totally blind, completely paralyzed, mute, but still alive. He could hear. He had been clinically dead, according to what the doctors told him, for at least six to eight minutes. And that's what caused the, the various conditions he woke up with. He'd also had, apparently, some strokes as part of the, the side effects of the whole thing. He had been stabbed in the heart. But somehow, somebody found him soon enough to get him to a hospital to save his life. When I met him, I met him actually at Soganji, the year I was a uh, guest housekeeper. He and his girlfriend and, and a male friend of his who'd come along to be of assistance if necessary were traveling to India. And they had met the Roshi uh, somewhere in Europe and really connected with him. Mario was at once the most amazing person I've ever met and at the same time the most simple and let go, clear and present human being. Most people, if you're standing before them and you close your eyes, there's, there's an energy that you can feel. With Mario, there was nobody. It was remarkable. He had totally let go. It took him seven months, I think it was, before he could begin to see light and dark, and eventually he regained his vision. He concentrated on making one of the toes on his feet move, and three months later, it happened. And gradually he healed. By the time I met him, he was walking, talking, um, had a girlfriend, 
and she was a long-term girlfriend. I believe they're still together, and this was oh, 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago that I met him. Nowadays, he lives in Europe and, and teaches. He spoke to us at Sogenji, and I guess the Roshi had asked him to tell us his story, which is how we know about it. He's not one to advertise himself. And one thing he did say was that when he learned to think again, when he was able to think again, because for many, many months, his brain was not uh, rewired to the point where he could think. He was fully present, and obviously deeply present, because he was actually healing himself. He had recognized uh, when he was quite a bit younger that he actually could heal other people. And so he worked on himself and healed himself. When he was able to think again, he said it was an enormous disappointment. Suddenly there was something between him and total presence. Most of the time we are living in a, in a world of our own where we're sort of present, but most of the time we're thinking in the background. We're thinking a lot. We're analyzing, we're comment, commenting on everything we think, everything we see, everything we encounter. And that keeps us living above life, hovering. If you've ever skipped stones on water, uh, you know, you get them going, uh, kind of a flat stone, and they just skip, 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 touching the water every so often, most of the time above it, not in contact with it. And that's how most people live their lives. And then we wonder why it's not fulfilling, why it's not as rich as meaningful as we're told it can be, or we may remember it being from as a small child. In a nutshell, to practice Zen is to become increasingly present in increasing moments in our life, so present that who we think we are, that whole accumulation of self-image disappears. It's good practice for the end of life, too, because when we die, we're not going to be able to take anything with us, including our self-image. And often, people will die in circumstances where uh, it might not be as pretty or as ideal as they would like it to be. Some people die peacefully in their sleep. Other people die in car accidents. Other people are killed various different ways. Other people die of cancer, or as John Sellers did in the middle of a medical procedure. And again, I quote that verse from the Momokan, how will it be for you when the light of your eyes is falling? Will you be like the crab with its seven arms and eight legs struggling to get out of the boiling water? My former daughter-in-law who worked in a hospital many, many, many years ago told me once about the elderly ladies who would die clutching their crucifixes, and their bodies would writhe for hours after they died as if they were still trying to prevent it from happening. Will we simply let go? 
don't find a new exploration, or where we try desperately to cling to this life, to cling to this self-image, to cling to these presumed possessions. But I've digressed. The potential for our practice is to become so incredibly liberated that as Jacques Lucerani uh, discovered in Buchenwald, after he had a deep awakening experience, even in the midst of the hell realm, one can find true joy. And speaking of that, I'd like to share something of Hakuin Zenji again. Um, Hakuin was an amazing human being of great energy, it appears, given the uh, volume of uh, things he wrote. Uh, his vast array of artwork and the fact that he was um, had quite the personality as you'll you'll get as we share some of these writings of his this is from a collection of his writings called the complete poison blossoms from a thicket of thorn it was translated by Norman Waddell who is the premier translator of Hakuin, to begin with, and, and uh, a number of other masters as well. He seems to just get the personality of Hakuin. And he's got a, uh, a wonderful way with words. Norman went to Japan uh, because he was so interested in poetry and wanted to meet R.H. Blythe, who was living in Japan at the time. And he stayed married a Japanese woman who's got a voice like a bell. She has the most beautiful voice I've ever heard. And she answers the telephone. I don't know if he has kids or not. When I met him a couple of different times, um, that was not part of the discussion. More of his discussion on whether or not he would go ahead and translate the deeper teachings of Hakuin, because he wasn't sure whether people would really get them. And he did prevail. And so we have what is encompassed in here is his, his complete teachings. There are many, many books out. If you want to read Hakuin, uh, Wild Ivy is, is one of his autobiographies, and it's, it's a wonderful, inspiring book. This one has got talks that he gave, short ones, long ones, various different teachings. It's a very thick volume. And I'd like to share with you today, where are we now? jump into the middle of this. This is about a monk named Zin Kai. In the Shotoku era, which is 1711 to 1715, there was a priest in Edo, which is present day Tokyo, who called himself Zenkai. He is said to have been a nephew of Ichō Ryōjin. He began his Zen practice at the age of 23 and experienced a Kensho. Unfortunately, he did not encounter a real teacher and never learned about post-Satori practice, which, as you've already heard here, is vital. We have a Kensho experience that allows us to see more clearly up to a point. It's extremely rare that anyone, particularly in this day and age, would have, would have such a deep Kensho experience that they saw all the way to the bottom. Mo 
long schedule experiences these days are relatively lightweight. But it's enough to see where you need to work. And hopefully we continue working because that's certainly not an end. It's a beginning, really. And as you heard, Hakuin himself, his first Kensho experience he thought was the most amazing thing in 300 years, but it wasn't. It was a Kensho experience. He definitely had seen more clearly, but it certainly wasn't the final thing. And he had 19 major Kensho experiences, 18 more after that one, before he finally felt truly at peace. This is a model for all of us, not to stop. When I went to my first sashim, a four-day sashim in Rochester, after the end of the sashim, the three of us sat up until midnight talking, which is not the best idea for a post-sashim um, experience. And one of us had had a Kensho a year earlier, and she was just riding on the coattails of it for a whole year, not bothering to practice much, certainly not bothering to deepen herself. Finally, she had come back to her senses and was coming back to Sashin again. It's important. That experience of Hakuin's where he assumed that he had had uh, such an amazing deep Kensho is what we would call a Zen sickness. And it does happen to people after they've had a relatively minor Kensho. If you've had a deep enough Kensho, normally it wouldn't strike because you see so clearly that, well, of course it's this way. And it's so ordinary, it's so of course. And yet that of course is never miraculous, amazing, truly amazing. And we don't realize that until we pop back into our usual state of mind. And that means we have to work a great deal more to open up again and more permanently to that mind of clarity and freedom and ease. And that takes a lot of work. It's important. Not that work isn't being done before we get a Kensho experience, and that's something to recognize. We can often assume, as I did, that until I have a Kensho experience, uh, my practice is really not doing anything at all. But that's not the case. It's preparing the basis to support that Kensho experience. It is possible to have a Kensho too early. As long as we keep working, that's the most important thing. Keep chewing on that koan or keep reaching deep within. Not in a way that's stressful, but in a way that's filled with perplexity and curiosity. And settling deep down to open to what's always been there. To continue. He began Zen practice at the age of 23 and experienced a Kensho. Unfortunately, he did not encounter a real teacher and never learned about post-Satori practice. Remaining attached to the understanding he'd attained, he continued to practice, quote, withered tree, close quote, sitting. But he lamented how difficult he still found it to control the workings of his mind. <clears throat> he decided to enter the mountains of Kumano on the Ku Peninsula, cut himself off from the outside world and devote himself to an austere training regimen. On his way, he passed through Awano in Mino province, thinking to stop for a while with several priests of his acquaintance who were residing there. When Zenkai's friends met him and saw the strength he'd attained in his pursuit of the way, they were more than glad to take him in, but they were dismayed when they heard of his plan to proceed into the forests of Kumano. 
when they urged him to find a quiet hermitage in Hino, Zenkai agreed and gave up his idea of going to Kumano. It is a thousand pities that because the student fails to encounter a genuine teacher at the beginning of his training and remains ignorant of the practice that continues after Satori, he will delight in cutting himself off from the world and immersing himself in a pure existence of this kind. Engaging in such profitless, silent meditation, he focuses intently on ridding his mind of thoughts and attaining a state of no mind, constantly sweeping away thoughts and doing everything he can to keep his mind empty and pure. This is a mistaken understanding of what Zen practice is. The traditional teaching has been to cut your thoughts. And there's an underlying assumption there that we, we need to get rid of our thoughts. We need to get to a mind where we're not thinking at all. And so we try mightily to stop thinking. But thinking is a tool and it has its use. And to cut off all possibility of thinking is to become an idiot in, in the less than optimal way. It is something I had to back out of in my early years of Zen practice. I suddenly realized that I was getting so good at cutting thoughts that when I needed to think, I couldn't. And that wasn't a good place to be. So I had to back out and begin thinking again and learn a different way to work with it. Thoughts are not the problem unless we attach to them. It's clinging that is the problem, not the thoughts themselves. And as Bunke would say, as you're listening to this talk, you hear the sound of a car in the distance. Maybe you're hearing the sound of maybe crickets or a bird chirping. There's the sound of a motorcycle. But you're mainly paying attention to what I'm saying. Hopefully it's interesting enough. And that's how you work with thoughts. You let them carry on in the background if they need to. They'll die out sooner or later when they're not given attention. The challenge is that we are so habituated to what Kapoor Roshi called thoughting. The yada, 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 yada that goes along in the background of our minds, which tends to be there as a comfort because it makes us feel like we exist. And as Descartes so famously said, I think, therefore I am. So if we're not thinking, do we disappear? Who are we? The very thought of that can be alarming to some people. One of the things that people comment on when they meet uh, a group of Zen practitioners who've had uh, a certain level of experience is that they're comfortable with silence. And uh, I remember uh, years ago during the AIDS epidemic, when I was living at the Rochester Zen Center, we became involved in uh, the AIDS interfaith network that was started because there are certain fundamentalist Christian groups that were going into the hospital rooms of dying AIDS patients and telling them that they were sick because they were evil and that was God's punishment. And we wanted this other group of churches and spiritual communities who didn't agree with that and felt that the, what was needed more was the option for spiritual support. We weren't going to put ourselves out there and make people come and use us in or anything, but we wanted to be available. And so there was a coalition of spiritual communities that got together. And every month they would offer uh, free um, evening service in their tradition at the various different churches in town. And um, people were welcome to come who weren't part of the, the church particularly anybody impacted by AIDS, which didn't necessarily mean somebody sick, but 
family members, friends, and so on, as well as anybody who was diagnosed with AIDS. And back then, AIDS was, was a death sentence. Not only a death sentence, but a very, not, a very painful, trying death sentence. And once a year, this group would hold a, a, a common um, service where everybody would be get together and we'd all have parts. And in the beginning, they didn't know what to do with uh, we Zen folks. So they programmed in three different times during this all night vigil, a moment of silence. That was, that was our Zen part. None of us were in uh, at the podium at the time. Uh, that wasn't an option. Somebody else was uh, controlling the, the event each of these times. But at not a single time could that person get through 60 seconds of silence. They had to cut it short. It was too uncomfortable simply to be with the silence for 60 seconds. So back to Zenkai. Zenkai resided in a hermitage he built in Mino for 40 years. With growing age, his resolve began to falter. His heart grew weary. He found that the more he tried to sweep thoughts from his mind, the more confused his mind became. He had lived to a considerable age as a Buddhist priest, but now as death drew nearer, he became forced, focused on his fear of the sufferings that lay ahead in the next world. He began quietly to recite the Nembutsu. That's, um, that's not Zen, but it is Buddhist. Namo Amida Buddha. In time, he came to regard this as a rather roundabout way of reaching awakening, so he started repeating his own name instead, Zenkai, Zenkai, over and over. Where had the original attainment he had experienced as a young monk gone? His nights were now plagued by bad dreams, his days tormented by troubling thoughts. He visited various Buddhist teachers seeking their advice on how to break through this impasse. They told him he was suffering from Zen sickness and could offer him no help. He took to Mopti and Bao and doing Zazen with tears in his eyes. One priest, feeling pity for him, said, Why don't you go to Suraga province and see Master Kokuyun, which is Hakuyun? I'm sure he'll be able to help you. And with considerable difficulty, owing to his great age, Zen Kai made the long trip to my temple in Suraga and earnestly requested an interview. The monk who received him came to my chambers with a smile on his face. A grubby old priest with a broken down old pilgrim's case on his back just showed up, he reported. His hair is tangled like a mugwort ball. He's got a filthy face and his robe and his sedge hat are in tatters. He requested an interview with you in a gruff accent of the Bondo region. Will you see him? I said, tell him I'm sick. Give him something to eat and send him on his way. Then I heard a voice shouting loudly from outside the gate. I'm an old man, I'm over 80 years old. I under, undertook a very long journey to come here. Are you going to pretend you're sick and just send me away? Where is your compassion? I had little choice but to grant his request. He came into my chambers. I suffered for years from Zen sickness. He blustered, please master, in your great compassion, do something, help me. Tell me about your Zen sickness. What's it like, I asked. I'm troubled by thoughts in the daytime. At night, I have bad dreams, he replied. Do you know what is having troubling, those troubling thoughts, I asked. Stop, please. I can't bear to think about emptiness, he said. Well, what's wrong with contemplating emptiness, I said. If a person attaches to emptiness, he'll surely fall into hell. Now come a little closer. I'm going to free you from your suffering. Certainly glad to hear that, he said, and drew towards me. Do you know how many hells exist for someone attached to emptiness, I asked. No, I don't know that, he replied. There are 86. 
Now, I want you to go down into hell right now and distribute yourself among all 36. Wordless, the priest stared at me, pie-eyed. Go on, get down there into them. Priests are supposed to save you from hell. What kind of teacher would try to send a student there, he cried. You say you're from Kanto, but it seems you've never heard about Suzuki Shosan, who said, the direct rough-hewn spirit of a Kanto is very close to Zen. If you were really a Kanto priest, you should be able to jump into hell without a second thought. Could you, he said, Get down there and explore the hells, one by one. There's not a single one I haven't fallen into. And I want to say something about this. As we do our practice, all kinds of things come up. And sometimes they can be hellish. Sometimes they can be hellish simply because they're repetitive. Sometimes they can be hellish because they're extremely uncomfortable and you really don't want to feel them. What is Hakuin telling this man to do? Don't do this. Open your arms and embrace the experience. What is hell really like? Go down there and taste it. Every single one of them. And as we do our practice, we have plenty of opportunities to do this. And you'll see what happens next. He abruptly prostrated himself before me. His eyes had filled with tears. What a great and wonderful teacher you are, Master Hakuin, he said. Your compassion has liberated me, allowed me to break completely free from my delusions. I feel as though I've suddenly awakened from a terrible dream. There's no way I can describe the joy I now feel. He prostrated himself 20 or 30 times, crying and laughing all the while. He then left, returned to the guest quarters, latched the door shut, and went to sleep. The next morning, Zinkai approached me with a broad smile on his face. I asked him whether he'd had any bad dreams during the night. I haven't enjoyed a sound sleep for over 40 years. The last night, I slept like a log. Said. It's the difference between a mediocre physician who just doles out the same medicine for all his patients and a great one who prescribes a purgative at just the right time. If you'd not applied that purgative just when you did, how could you have saved me from that terrible sickness? When he finished speaking, Zenkai performed I don't know how many prostrations before me. I myself was overcome with joy. I spelled out to him, in slow and deliberate terms, the importance of the practice that comes after Satori. I also gave him a piece of paper inscribed with the four universal vows. It's the four Bodhisattva vows. He came to me a few days later, made his parting vows, and with mixed feeling of joy and sorrow, went on his way. in practice we don't hide from anything it's important to allow ourselves to fully experience the energy of whatever comes up for us jump into one of those or all of those 86 hells don't be afraid. When we open to the energy of whatever it is that's going on in our body, whatever it is that manifests as something we fear, something we don't like, if we stay out of the story and simply allow ourselves to experience, to practice that radical acceptance when we stay present with the experience long enough, it will simply dissolve and there will be a sense of relief and suddenly we will be deeper in our practice. This is how to work with obstacles. 
I don't know of anyone whose practice simply goes smoothly deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Because all of us are caught in different ways through our conditioning. And without being able to see it, we can't let it go. And seeing it is what we usually try to hold behind our back. Yet seeing it, experiencing the energy of it, is what will free us and open wider the gate so that we can ultimately see the truth about ourselves and then continue and see it more deeply and more broadly and continue yet and continue yet and continue yet until we are totally free. And that can take lifetimes, but what a joyous practice when we know how to practice. I thank you for listening. We'll stop now and recite the full hours. <laughs>